I've entitled my piece, Demographics, Derivatives, and the Social Contract, Why a Liberal Arts Degree is Essential to Inner Peace and Digestive Harmony. <laughs> Every week I open the Globe and Mail and at some point one of the columnists gets all windy over the state of today's youth. It has been ever thus. I am sure that in the years before anybody bothered to count, Aristotle's grandparents gathered around the evening ouzo and rambled on about how little Ari didn't understand the value of a day's work, <laughs> that he was unappreciative and generally entitled. It is the same today. <laughs> today we are compelled to endure the gesticulating columnist. Lately, the columnist's rants seem to focus on the relevance of a liberal arts education. Is it a path to a meaningful destination or training for life as a well-spoken, underemployed dependent? <laughs> My answer to today's question is either neither and it never was. It was always an exercise in demographics, derivatives, derivatives and the social contract. So let's talk about demographics. I am a trailing edge baby boomer. I have much more in common with the bust generation that came after me than with the leading edge boomers currently in their late 60s who preceded me. My cohort experienced the beginning of limited university funding, the end of tuition grants, and double digit interest, double -digit interest rates on student loans. Yes, I paid 21% on one of my student loans. But let's not get all weepy for my cohort. <laughs> The various government bodies provided 80 cents on the dollar for the cost of the undergraduate student. There were lots of on-campus part-time jobs, and I could charge all of my books at the Trent Bookstore by using my student card as an interest-free credit card. As such, it was possible for me to be a self-supporting student, and when I was done, compared to most of today's students, my debt was modest. For today's students, in my view, the reality is completely different. Today, government funds roughly 50 cents on the dollar, undergraduate debt looks more like my first mortgage, and there are fewer on-campus opportunities to earn income. Ultimately, without some combination of family support, student loan, part-time jobs, and scholarships, today's students could not attend. And we haven't even begun to talk about the fluckata fluckata sound that helicopter parents can make from thousands of miles away. A liberal arts degree does not prepare a person for a specific career. It was never intended as a specific lifetime destination. That's why community colleges and graduate schools exist. An undergraduate degree is best understood as the foundation for a building that's under construction. How do I know this? The demographic trends. Even for those who enter a destination program such as education, nursing, or engineering, the statistics are clear. On average, most of us will make seven complete career changes in a lifetime. A career change is a total change in job responsibility and definition. Moreover, it is predicted that the millennial generation currently emerging from university ranks will retrain three times completely before they leave the workforce. Now, the columnists will say that has to do with their incredibly short attention span. <laughs> but I think it has more to do with the fact that the millennial generation is more actively involved in a debate over work-life balance than any generation that's come before. Why be unhappy doing one thing when you could be happy doing a variety of things? For those in think who think and plan around demographics, the opportunity is going to be significant. According to some studies, if current birth and immigration remain, rates remain as they are, there will be a massive skill shortage by the year 2031. Should this prove true, the, the, the current millennials are going to be rewarded in cold, hard cash. In many ways, the opportunity open to university-educated millennials is the same as that experienced by the parents of the boomers who are currently in their 70s and 80s. Those were the people who experienced the greatest prolonged economic expansion in history. Which brings me to derivatives. Derivatives is an economic term, a financial instrument whose value is derived from one or more underlying assets. The value of the liberal arts degree lies in its ability to equip the graduate with the skills to assess the worlds in terms of their own derivative potential. If I train as an elementary school teacher and I want to work in southeastern Ontario, I should not be surprised when I am frustrated by the limited number of opportunities to learn and develop my craft. If I take my training to Uganda, I will be overwhelmed by the opportunities. My eldest daughter is a graduate of the Development Studies program here at Trent. 
Two years ago, she went into business with her mother, where they now run an environmental general store in Kingston. They are all about sustainability. They sell everything from bamboo clothing to environmentally friendly laundry soap. She uses her degree every day as she researches new products, anticipates the needs of her customers, and otherwise applies all the theoretic knowledge she was provided here at Trent. Along the way, she did an apprenticeship. She worked at the Body Shop, Lens Crafters, and Northern Getaway. At various times, she could have relocated to a larger center, Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, but she chose not to. If she had, she could have worked in some head office capacity, but that's not where her derivative exploration took her. She didn't want to live in a major urban center. Her derivative assets needed something else. So she worked at the, lower, at the local level and she learned how to stock shelves, merchandise products, and create long-term local customer relationships. And now she runs her own enterprise. My youngest daughter is a journalist. To practice her craft, she lives and works in Doha, Qatar as an editor for Time Out magazine. Her derivative exploration took her to the other side of the world where she developed a different set of derivative dreams. While her process seems exotic and even romantic, it has also been an, an apprenticeship punctuated with isolation. There is no quick fix. You can't sidestep the apprenticeship however much the helicopter parents would like their offspring to begin their professional lives as middle managers. Which brings me to the social contract. At Trent, I learned about responsibility and relationship. For me, the undergraduate experience was an oasis of free and open discourse. I can't say I remember much about the content of the classes, but I remember their people, the people, and I remember their passion. Many of us were the first in our families to attend a university, and I understood very quickly that life at Trent happens in narrative. In the narrative, I'm required to seek my calling. Security is a state of mind. As an undergraduate, I learned the difference between risking and settling. It was a place and time where you were supposed to put your hand up and say, I don't get it. Or even better, I disagree. You're wrong. I believe the primary purpose of the undergraduate liberal arts degree is to give the student a set of collective experiences. In isolation, they may appear inconsequential, but in time, they become moments of crystallized self-awareness and epiphany. The purpose of a liberal arts degree, degree is not to avoid the, the apprenticeship or to make a ton of effortless money. The experience takes place in the narrative. It's how we learn to live, leave the world better than we found it. To this end, I would like to offer you an, a narrative of my own. And I leave, it you to I leave it to you to decipher the demographic from the derivative and the derivative from the social contract. In 1980, the most popular course on the Trent campus was Canadian Studies 300. It began every Friday morning at 9 a.m. with a film followed by a lecture followed by a discussion. There were spaces in the course for 50 people, hereafter known as the favored 50. Each week, 200 students packed the Battle Library Lecture Hall for the movie and the lecture, after which they were ushered from the room. While some were there to quench an academic thirst, my motives were more basic. Among the favorite 50 was a goddess. <laughs> she had an IQ of 203 and a smile that made me weak in the knees, and in short, she was way out of my league. <laughs> I attended the Friday sessions in the hopes I would be noticed. To my credit, I paid attention, and I found ways to work into conversation, what I heard in class, in those spontaneous moments when we ran into each other. <laughs> this sounds really lame, but it's not as lame as it sounds. <laughs> At regular intervals, intervals, authors visited the course and did a two-hour Q&A with students. These were sessions were held in what is now the Season Spoon, what was then the Champlain College Senior Common Room. And students enrolled could bring a guest. In a moment of lapsed judgment, the woman of my dreams invited me to attend the Margaret Lawrence Q&A as her guest. In preparation, I read and reread all of Lawrence's trilogy in the hopes that I would impress. On the morning of the talk, Professor Wadlin explained that Miss Lawrence was really quite shy, that we were asked short, understandable questions, and that this was one of those moments we would remember for the rest of our lives. His overview did not do the experience justice. Ms. Lawrence was a short, stout woman, the kind of person who enjoyed a good joke and did not suffer fools. She half walked, half shuffled into the middle of the room and sat in the chair provided. 
In her hands were two extra-large country-style coffees. From her voluminous coat, she produced two packages of cigarettes, and the message was clear. I'm doing this as a favor to Professor Wadlin. When the coffee and cigarettes are gone, so am I. <laughs> and so it began. A series of focused questions and responses that illuminated and inspired. After 20 minutes, it was clear to me that this was a woman whose intelligence and wit was beyond anything I had ever encountered. As the process unraveled, she continued to drink coffee and smoke, lighting each new cigarette from the one just consumed. Lawrence was a whole body smoker in the tradition of Betty Davis. <coughs> she would inhale as a question was asked, and from where I sat, the more foolish or cliche the question, the longer she seemed to drag on that cigarette. And then it happened, the stupid question of the day. A question so pretentious and so full of itself that most of the students looked at the floor in embarrassment. It came from a young man in the corner, a tall drink of water whose head seemed too large for the rest of him. His question began with the long preamble of one who aspires to big words and rarefied air. It involved metaphors and pathos, adjectives and social commentary, and Ms. Lawrence loved it. She recognized the young man as the kind of person who mastered other people's ideas, but had none of his own. For an instant, there was a flicker of a grin, and then she lit a new cigarette. <laughs> and the next moment, she inhaled. And the ash at the end of the cigarette seemed to grow as if it were in a moment of time-lapse photography. I swear to God, she inhaled the entire cigarette. <laughs> and then she exhaled a cloud of smoke that enveloped her face. She paused, and everybody leaned forward as if to catch her response. And then from inside the cloud, it came. It was precise, it was understated, it was transcendent. And she said, and here I thought, it was just a hell of a good story. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh.